Hoops Heaven proudly brings to you Basketball Hustle, featuring your host, the writer, Chris Pike, and the scoring machine, Sean Redditch. Now it's time for another episode of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. Welcome everyone to the second episode of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. We've made it for our first show. We hope you enjoyed it if you managed to tune in. And I'm Chris Pike, your co-host, and I'm here with the man of the moment, the man that you're all all here to, to listen to, I'm sure. Sean Redditch, thanks for joining us again. Thanks, I'm excited. Episode two upon us and a uh, lot to talk about. Let's get into it. Absolutely, it was a, a fantastic round one of NBL basketball. And obviously we saw a thriller in Perth with the Wildcats doing what the Wildcats do and finding a way to win in the... The grand final rematch, and you know we saw the Brisbane Bullets look pretty pretty impressive when they had a win as well. The South East Melbourne Magic, M- Melbourne Magic, that's going to happen a lot. The, the the Phoenix obviously got off to a to a winning start as well, and and the Sydney Kings got the job done against the Cairns Taipans. Um, but first of all, our show here, Sean. This is our second episode. What was the feedback you got on the first show, and and how do you think we went? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, we had some fantastic guests, Dylan Boucher, Damian Martin, uh, you know, two uh, legends uh, of the NBL, and I'm excited about uh, the guests that we have today as well, and, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a great way to reach uh, a medium to reach our new fans, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to bring some, some great interviews and some great insight to the NBL and basketball. Well, let's not let our listeners wait too long. Um, the guest for, for today, really excited to have a chat to to, well, it'll be the three men, the three men that we end up talking to once we get the two-minute drill involved as well. But first of all, Ben Madgen, um, new to the, the South East Melbourne Phoenix this year, back to the NBL after, after a pretty long career at the Sydney Kings. You spent a lot of time playing against him when he was at the Kings. You had a lot of success against him as well. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on Ben and what we can have a chat to him about? Well, I'm excited to see, you know, his grown in his career and obviously he did tremendously well in the NBL when he took his trade over to the Europe and, and now back to the NBL. So just kind of find out more about his decision making there. But, you know, Ben's one of those guys that can just flat out score and just knows how to get the ball in the hole. And I think he's going to be a huge uh, uh, key piece to Southeast Melbourne Phoenix success this year. And then our second guest, Drake you a guy that you played in a championship with at the Perth Wildcats. And... Gee, he's gone on to some big things already since he's since his playing career. He's now working at the the Stockton Kings, the the assistant general manager there, the the G League franchise of the Sacramento Kings, and he's he's been working at the Sacramento Kings and he's been doing a lot of scouting work. He's been watching Lamelo Ball and RJ Hampton pretty closely. He's going to have a lot of interesting insights to to give to us. He is. He's going to have a. Uh, it is going to be interesting to see his obviously a player in the NBL. Now he's on the other side scouting the NBL and 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 in the. Uh, NBA and the G League over there as well. So he's got a, a unique perspective on things. So I think it'll be great to catch up with him and, and see uh, what he's learned and, yeah. and where uh, he sees the NBL and, and, and especially LaMelo Ball as well. I'm excited about that one. To me, one of the exciting parts of doing this show with you is the chance for you to to reconnect with people from your playing career, whether it was guys that you played with and against like Dylan Boucher last week or you shared a championship with five years ago with, with Drake U. But otherwise, you might not always get the chance to catch up with these guys. So this is a chance for you to probably connect with people that otherwise you might not always get to. Yeah, it's a good point. You, you know, you get busy with your own lives and um, you know, everyone's off to their, their own thing. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm excited about uh, both these players as well. They're uh, fantastic players and people as well. So it's a, it's a great way to uh, reconnect in that, in that regards. Now, of course, we wouldn't be here, Sean, without the support of Hoops Heaven. The, the minute we started this show, they were, they were very quick to jump on board. Fantastic supporters. We'll have a, have a bit more of a chat about them in a minute. But, but for Jason and the team at Hoop7, hoop7.com.au, we wouldn't be here without them. And thank you again to their support. And, and our first show, we got some, some great feedback from it. And for anybody listening and, and wondering where you can have a listen, we've got it, made it available as many places as possible. If you go to iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, YouTube, MyTuner Radio, We've tried to make it available pretty much everywhere you can find a podcast. We want you to be able to find this show because we want you to be able to tune in and have a listen to us. And another exciting announcement that we can make this week is that from this week onwards, we will be available on on 91.3 Sport FM here in Perth. And through sportfm.com.au, you'll be able to listen to us live through that as well. So great to have another partner on board. Yeah, Sport FM getting on board. I actually spoke to them earlier in the week, gave my thoughts 
um, about the NBL round. So uh, tune into them and you get everything sport that you need. So great to have them on board. Now let's get into the action, Sean. Um, round one of the NBL. Um, let's just hit the, the biggest talking point on the head first of all. Um, not always great when it's not the action on the court that becomes the biggest talking point of, of your game, but it's hard to avoid the fact that a lot of people were talking about the, the TV coverage and the decision to broadcast the games from a hub in Melbourne now instead of having the commentators on, on the floor at games. Obviously, it got, got some mixed feedback and, and all of our listeners will have their own thoughts on what they thought. But from your point of view, you're the man on the ground in Perth still. You're still involved in the coverage and and you're the man that's providing the updates from Perth back to the commentators in Melbourne. Can you just talk us through how it worked and, and what it involves from your point of view? Because we, we can everyone will have their opinions on what they, th- they think of the idea, but you, you're the, one of the very few people that can actually tell us how it works. Yeah, well, I think it's a, a little bit different this year. They're obviously going to have the games out of Melbourne in the hub. Uh, it's it's something to where I think that they'll be able to streamline everything and, and, and have the producers and everything there in Melbourne. And, uh, you know, from my point of view, it makes my role a little bit different, more of a sideline role. So I was able to go into the uh, huddles a little bit more and see it from that point of view. And then there's some teething issues. That's always going to be when you're changing the way you're doing broadcast. But I thought from game one to game four, there was a, a much better improvement. And hopefully they'll continue to make some strides this week. But it's, uh, you know, it's a decision that, that they've made. And I think that hopefully, uh, uh, you know, the fans are still going to have a great experience uh, watching the NBL because the product out there is fantastic. I think you make a good point. I don't think too many people were that upset by what they saw by Sunday afternoon. I think a lot of the, the, the clinks from Friday night and Thursday night were, were ironed out. It might not be ideal, but I think in the long term for the benefits that the league sees in doing it this way, I, I think there's there's merit to it. Um, from your point of view, what's it like to get to go and see some opposition huddles? You probably haven't done that a lot during your career and when you have been broadcasting over the last you know, 12 or 18 months you've been sitting at the commentary desk what was it like to actually go and have a look at some, some huddles? Well, it kind of felt like I was a player again being back in there seeing Trevor or Dean Vickerman draw up a play and, and, and then be able to get to see that when they go back out on the court and did they execute and there was a few times where uh, it looked like the guys were a little confused in the huddle and then they went out and they didn't even execute the play so uh, it's just kind of seeing those inside is it, it, fun from my point of view and uh, hopefully it's a little bit different experience Uh, you probably don't have as big a role in the coverage but it's still fun to be sitting courtside and and being able to uh, witness a game that that happened on Saturday afternoon in Perth that was fantastic absolutely Um, before we get to that Thursday night in Melbourne great to have a a Melbourne throwdown you know a Melbourne rivalry is always great for for the NBL and over history it always has been Um, what did you make of the game? Melbourne, the South East Melbourne Phoenix got the win. It was a thriller. Mitch Creek was was fantastic. Obviously, Chris Golding got hurt, but he but he was great as as well. So was so was Sean Long. Mallow Trimble, a bit of an interesting debut with seven turnovers in the first half. Um, what did you come away thinking about about that season opener? Oh, we, I mean, I predicted Southeast Melbourne Phoenix would win. I just thought the the emotion of the first game. I've seen it when a few two teams have come into the league. Gold Coast uh, being one of them. The Blaze getting their first win as well. So I just kind of felt like the emotion would really help them, and and it did. They came out, they played fantastic, and they deserved to win that game. You know, Melbourne came in and, and got back into it, but probably just weren't polished and still trying to work out how they get Mello and Sean Long into it. But Sean Long, he just if they can use him in the right way, he can be the MVP of this league. That's that's what I took away from that first round. But one, he's got to stay out of foul trouble. And two, they've got to get him the basketball. When when they got him the basketball, it was a bucket every time. Yep, absolutely. Um, Friday night up in Cairns, it, was, it seemed like we were watching a game from the Taipans last season where for three and a half quarters they were they were really competitive. They were they, they were in control of the game for, for a, lot of the, a lot of it. They were they, they were eight points up early in, in the last quarter, but they just couldn't finish the job done. Is that just a, is it an ongoing problem for, for Mike Kelly and the Taipans, or did they come up a very up against a very good opposition in the in the Sydney Kings? Uh, I think they're just going to have to figure out who their go-to guys are down the stretch. And that's something that you do when you get so many new guys. You're not really sure. You, obviously, they played great for 
35 minutes, but who are you going to get the basketball to in those final five minutes? Um, is, is Machado going to be the one? Uh, we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out, but that's something that they're going to have to figure out pretty quickly. Um, you know, I think Mike Kelly can be happy with the effort that his team put in, but it's, they're going to have to find a way to get a closer to be able to, uh, to be able to win some basketball games early on. They don't want to go down too many games. It's just this competition's too tough to get back into the hunt of things. Absolutely. Um, Saturday, Saturday afternoon in Perth, it was the grand final rematch. Obviously, Melbourne arrived without Casey Prather and, 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 and David Barlow, and then they, they lost Chris Golding just before, before tip-off as well. So the job was ahead of them. But like we talked about last week, the problem for Melbourne is going to be that there's only one basketball when they've got all their stars on the court. I felt that the fact that Mello Trimble and Mitch McCarron especially could have more time with the ball in their, in their hands, it made them play better because they could do their, do their thing. And I thought... It helped them. I thought Sean Long, Sean Long didn't have a great day, but, but then Alex Pledger did it instead. He, he stepped up, and, and one of their rookies, um, Joe Lowell Aquil, he was, he was very exciting. Um, but they didn't get the win. Tariko White steps up with 14 points in the last quarter, hits the game winner, and familiar story where a team can come into Perth and, and play well, but the Wildcats just know how to win. They do. There was uh, if Melbourne United, you take a lot of positives out of that. Obviously, they're sitting 0 and 2, so not too many positives after the first week. I felt like they deserved. I think the Wildcats probably thought that Melbourne United deserved that. But credit to the Wildcats, they played with the heart, and uh, that we've seen them in the past just really lift up their intensity in that second half. I thought they they got into that press because Melbourne United was playing so big. It was, uh, you know, it was something they could use that little pressure and go in a little bit of small ball, even Nick K at the five at times with Hunt in foul trouble. But I guess the, the question mark for me with the Wildcats is just the size. Can they match up with the size of a Sean Long, Andrew Bogut? Some of these big centers that um, can really dominate down there in the paint. I'm not sure that Hunt and Ms. Jacques are going to be able to do that for 40 minutes on a nightly basis. So it's going to have to, you know, they manufactured a win, I thought, through their pressure. Um, but they're going to have to try and find some ways to see if they can get a little bit more productivity out of their big men, I think. Absolutely. But speaking of big men for the Wildcats, Nick Kay, um, he's, been, he's been fantastic ever since he's been in the league. But He's experienced with the Boomers over over this off season and and playing at the World Cup. He just looks like a he looks like a totally different player right now. And he was already at a very high standard. He looks stronger. He looks more confident. His game's better at both ends of the floor. He he's he has every reason to think that he could win the MVP of this league right now. Yeah, that's a big call. I think he, he you know what he's got a guy on his team named Bryce Cotton <laughs> that might take a few votes yeah. away from him, but. Uh, you know, I think he's the best power forward in the league and uh, just does it from a variety of different reasons. I think any coach would be happy to have Nick Kay on their team. What about for Melbourne now? They go 0-2, they've got some injuries, and now they head across to the United States to play two, two, two NBA opponents. Is that horrible timing for them? How do you feel that is for a start of the season? Well, I was telling someone this week, I just kind of feel like the NBL needs to, if they're going to do the NBA games, which I think is great, and the exposure, had 100 scouts just watching the New Zealand Breakers and RJ Hampton just train the other day. So it's fantastic. A million people watching. I just would like to see them move the season back a week. Let those teams go over, play NBA, then come back and let's start the NBL after they've started playing. Because the NBA is not going to change when they play their games. So let's let's start the NBL a week later. Let's get the, every team go over there, play an NBA game, get that experience. It's fantastic for the league, the players. Everything about it is a positive. And then it gives everyone on an even playing field. You know, now you've got Melbourne United's going to go over there, play two games, fly back on a Saturday, and then have to play the champs and the Wildcats on Sunday at home. So it's a tough stretch for them. Not only that, they're, they're down three stars at the moment. So it's, a, uh, it, it, it's an interesting one. They could be sitting here 0-3. Um, and they're many predict as the favourites. Yeah. I think you make a good point. I see no reason why we couldn't start the season a week or two later and have all 10, all, all 10 of our NBL clubs go over there because, because right now the Cairns Taipans and Illawarra Hawks, you would think, are never going to get that chance in the current format because the, the bigger, bigger franchises are going to get that chance and 
Obviously, the Wildcats chose not to do it this year, but if it doesn't interrupt their preparation to a season, you would think the Wildcats would jump at that chance because there's there's so many benefits to it as long as it doesn't interrupt your actual NBL season. So maybe it's something, instead of some of the talk that's going around right now about dumping it all together, maybe we expand it next season and instead have every club go over there and every club can have a week there and then we start the season once everyone gets back. Well, and maybe even have the preseason blitz yep. over there. I mean, 27 scouts from the U.S. came over here just to watch, so mm-hmm. why not bring that over there? Let's get 100, let's get 150 yeah. scouts to the preseason blitz, go over there, play your preseason games, and then go play NBA games, come back here. Mm-hmm. The season's ready. You've got the publicity of it all. I think it's uh, something that I would, I would be excited to uh explore that possibility if I was the NBL I think there could be a lot of positives out of that and I think that should take us with us too <laughs> take us with them sorry <laughs> trip to the US. Um, now the round finished on, on Sunday in the gong Illawarra and the Brisbane Bullets and to me the, the Brisbane Bullets looked in control of that game pretty much the whole way they they looked a pretty well well drilled, drilled outfit especially considering obviously Lamanus and, and Glidden and, and Sobey have been away with the national team. They looked well drilled. Lamar Patterson, he might not look in great shape, but boy, he can deliver. And he, look, he looked terrific with what he produced he, without looking great physically. But I just thought the Bullets controlled that game and, and there was a lot to like from, from their point of view. Yeah, they, you know, they got off to a slow start last year. Mm-hmm. They lost to Cannes, so it was a, a good win for them. Any road win you can get in this league is good. There was a lot of uh, excitement around LaMelo's ball's first game, so I thought he played pretty good basketball, and uh, you know, I think there's still some improvement there and probably some decision-making on the, from the shot taking point of view but it was uh, credit to Brisbane they kind of did have mostly in control didn't get a lot of production from their big men outside of yeah. Matty Hodgson but their guard stepped up which is what they built the the team around yeah, absolutely um, Aaron Brooks pretty solid didn't probably didn't shoot the ball great but he's clearly going to be a, a big numbers numbers man this season the Hawks they shot four of 25 from three which is never going to get the job done but you touched on Lamelo Ball, and that's probably, let's be honest, that's probably why the majority of the people that watched that game were watching it. Um, his numbers were good: twelve points, eight rebounds, four assists, four steals. Um, some of his offensive plays were, were really good. Um, like you said, his shot selection maybe not great. He might not be a, a great three-point shooter right now, so he might need to put that away a little bit. But defensively is where he needs to keep improve, keep improving. But he looks like he's here to do all the hard work to, to improve. He's not just here here for, for a free ride. No, I think he's got a lot. Uh, he's probably got the most uh, upside out of, out of everyone there, and he's probably got the most uh, to, to gain by having a great season. So, uh, you know, credit to him. I, you know, you see him out on the beach working out the next day, doing some defensive slides. I don't think I ever did some defensive slides on the beach, but <laughs> hey, we'll see if that helps him. Uh, he got four steals in game one, so maybe he'll, he'll up that and, and give Damian Martin a run for his money in the defensive player of the year uh, category this year. But it's a... It, it, from the Hawks' point of view, I just like to see the ball movement a little bit more. You know, it got stuck in Lamelo Ball's hands uh, quite a bit. Aaron Brooks's hands quite a bit. They've got enough shooters. The the way I think they're going to be able to compete is if they move the ball a little bit more. And I'm sure Matty Flynn will be working on that during the week. Absolutely. Now that covers round one for us, and we'll get on to to Ben Madgen very very shortly for our for our first guest on our our second episode here of of Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. Now, as you can tell by the name of our show, Hoop 7, massive supporters of us, Sean, and some, some terrific feedback from them last week. They were very happy with our, with our first show, so thanks to, to Jason and his team for that. But, gee, if anyone wants anything for in terms of basketball gear, I know that when I'm looking for Christmas presents, I'm, I'm pretty keen to, like I said last week, to, to deck my, my sister out in some Celtics gear and my girlfriend Laura in some Hornets gear and... It's really tough to not buy stuff for myself. And right now, what stands out, I don't know if you've seen their, their stock of Team USA gear, but they've got, they've got jackets, they've got pants, they've got shorts, they've got singlets, they've got T-shirts, all in the Team USA colours. There's Scotty Pippen, there's Larry Bird. It's pretty tough to say no to, Sean. But once you walk into that store, it's, it's tough to say no to a lot of things. Yeah, I was in there over the weekend. They, uh, they even got large sizes for shoes, size 15. So if you're... Uh if you're a size 15, that's the place to go to get your basketball shoes. And yeah, there's a uh, if you're a basketball junkie like we are, place to go. Absolutely, and I think it might even go up to size 18. So 
If you're a real big fella, size 18 in shoes, go to Coop 7, you can get your gear in. And this week, the, the NBL Perth Wildcats gear is in, in store as well. So for any fans heading along to the game on Friday night against the Hawks, pop in, pop in there beforehand and, and get your gear in. You won't be disappointed. So hoop7.com.au for all your gear in. And thanks to Hoop 7 for their, for their support. Okay, welcome back here to the show here on on Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle, and our our first guest for for, for the, our second episode of, of our show is is Ben Madgen, as we talked about before. Back to the NBL this season with the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix. I think everyone's excited to have him back in the league after after what we we saw he was capable capable of at the at the Sydney Kings, and obviously got off to a winning start last week, and looking to do the the same on his home floor now. Now, now this weekend, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sean. Uh, it's great to be on the show. Um, it must be great to be back in the league as well. Obviously, we miss seeing seeing those those three balls from you over the the last five years, and and you you did some great things over in Europe. But I'm sure you're you're happy to be to be back home as well. Yeah, it's um, for, uh, looking from afar. You know, from Europe and seeing the league go from strength to strength, and um, the popularity um, of the league just over in in Europe with um, all the European guys, all the American guys, constantly asking me, "Hey, can you get me a job in the NBL?" <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just uh, it was great to see see the league from when I came in in 2010 um, to where it is now. Um, it's it's evolved so much, uh, and it's really really a positive thing for the sport, uh, you know, because it's participated um, at the grassroots level. Uh, it's always been strong there, um, but yeah, at the pro scene, it hasn't been as strong as it could be. And I think now we're really seeing that um, since Larry's taken it over. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And going back to last Thursday night season opener, I think everyone's excited that there's a, a Melbourne rivalry back in the league again. That's always been a massive part of the NBL. What was that like to be part of? And obviously to come away with a win, it made it for a, a pretty memorable occasion for you. Yeah, it was an awesome game to play in. Uh, the build up was huge. So uh, it was very emotional. Um, you know, we really wanted to win. Um, and I felt like, uh, well, we all kind of talked about before the game that we'd, we'd done a lot of work during the preseason. Uh, we'd been together probably a lot longer than some of the other teams. Um, besides Mitch, who was away with the Aussie team, we'd all kind of been there and the, some of the imports came in a bit later. But um, we felt like we were really prepared. Um, the coaching staff has done a great job. Um, with us throughout the preseason, so um, yeah, going into the game, we're really pumped, ready to go. Uh, we're probably a bit overexcited at times. I think watching the game back, uh, it was a bit scrappy. Probably didn't execute as much as we wanted, but I uh, felt like we played with a lot of heart, a lot of intensity, um, and so many people have commented on that. Um, you know. Uh, it was just a, a great game to be in, and when when it was over, we celebrated for a little bit in the change room. But it was a bit of a sense of relief mm-hmm. uh, for everyone involved. I think um, the ownership, uh, the office staff, all the players, coaching staff, just to be able to get that win on the board. Um, but you know, being a new franchise, a lot of people say it will take a lot of time. But if you look at our our squad, we've got a lot of experience, yep. uh, some really good veteran leadership along with some some really good youth um so i think this mix and the way the roster has been put together um has been tremendous because um it just feels like we gelled right from the start obviously we can Mm. keep it going and and build more chemistry together but um you know the the people the the personalities all fit um and everyone's got the common goal of, of you know doing everything the right way and um, there's no egos in the team so I think you know it's all set up to be successful mm-hmm. and uh, I don't feel like it's going to have those those big teething problems that maybe some of the new franchises have had in the past. Yeah well, it certainly doesn't look like it at this stage. Um, when we go back well it must be must be six six months now at least when you made the decision to sign with the Phoenix. At that point, were you always coming home and were you just looking to decide which NBL club to come to or was it the fact that whatever Tommy Greer sold you on made the decision for you to to come home at that point or how did it come about that you ended up signing? 
Yeah, well, I definitely hadn't decided on on coming home. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my wife would have liked to because uh, <laughs> uh, we went over just the both of us, and we came back with two kids yeah. as well. Um, so that was a big a big part of it. But um, I was still willing to play over in Europe. Um, I'd build up like a pretty good reputation there, been playing Euro Cup and, um, you know, still had some good offers on the table there, although I signed early um, mm. in the NBL. But, um, yeah, what I, I've been talking to Tommy actually for a couple of years, uh, along with some other teams, especially the Kings, um, about coming home. And uh, Tommy actually told me, you know, I've been kind of setting this up for a long time uh, for the for it to finally, you know, him to be in the GM role to bring me back. So um, some great conversations with Tommy and also Simon. And, um, you know, I just really liked the way they were building it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously with Mitch signing um, and I was talking to them uh, to South East Melbourne uh, around the same time. And uh, it just really felt right. Um, I, you know, I talked to to my wife Bria and and family and friends and we just really felt like it was a great time to come home and a uh, great opportunity and I haven't had one regret about mm. doing it. You touched on it a little bit before as well, but from the league that you left at the end of that 2013 season to the league that you're returning mm-hmm. to now, it's almost unrecognisable. Yeah, yeah, I think I left 15, 16. Yeah, sorry, um, yeah. But- yeah, I um, yeah, I was telling someone actually today that when I came in 2010 to now, you know, we have our own facility at the State Sports Centre that's, you know, booked out every day for us. We have our own players' room and, and even our own chef that cooks us breakfast mm. and, and lunch. I mean, if you told told me that when I signed with Sydney in 2010 <laughs> when we were training out at Macquarie University. Yeah. Um, I would have probably told you crazy. So it's really, you know, it's it's so good to be a part of now. It's so professional. Um, and I think a lot of people had the right idea back when I first started, but there just wasn't the funding and, mm. um, you know, the commercial kind of interest that there is now. Um, and I think, you know, it can only get better, especially – um, if the NBL were to sign, you know, that big TV rights deal yeah. um, that the other sports like AFL and NRL have. And I think, you know, that's the next step. And if, if we have that, then it will really, I think, boom into maybe even the powerhouse sport in the country. The, this chef you, you talked about, it, it got a bit of attention after Mitch mentioned it on the, the broadcast <laughs> after the game last Thursday. What, what can you tell me? I think it caught a lot of people by surprise that an NBL club has, has their own chef at the moment. Yeah, his name's Angelo and he's the biggest legend. I was um, just telling him today that you've been here for about four or five months and we still haven't had the same meal twice. Wow. So uh, He's fantastic. He's actually opening up his own restaurant, but he's worked all over the world in New York. And, um, yeah, he's just such a good chef. And um, he's not just a chef, but we also talk to him a lot about other things like diet, um, at the moment, I'm on like a. I'm trying to eat my meals within ten hours in mm-hmm. the day, um, which is something I hadn't heard of really until I talked to Angelo about it, and um, just tweaking little things here and there. Um, some guys have meal plans with him. Uh, he cooks them the meals and and they take them home. Um, so yeah, he's just uh, he's great there. He's uh, great to be around. He's very accessible and um, yeah, he's really helping us with our nutrition. At least you know some of the guys that probably don't cook a lot for themselves. You know they're having two really good cooked meals a day, uh, and then they just need a prepared dinner. Or like I said, Angelo will hook them up with that too. So yeah, it's fantastic. I think uh, Eric Collinsworth has set up a lot of good stuff for us off the court. Um, so that's been a real bonus. Mm. You had a really good run run with the Kings personally. Um, probably didn't quite have the team success you were hoping for, and and probably in a lot of ways it would have been the easy decision to stay stay in the league when you decided to to leave. But when you look back now, are you proud that you challenged yourself to go and play in Europe and you ended up having four really good years over there? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question because that's exactly why I did it. Um, mm. I actually opted out of my deal at Sydney yeah. um, after dislocating my shoulder and having a reconstruction. So when I opted out of my deal, I couldn't lift my um, arm above my waist. Mm. And I told my wife, like, this, we could really regret this. And she was actually the one that really pushed me. She said, you know, you've been aiming to do this for a long time. <laughs> I believe that you can get your arm right. And uh, even when I first went to Belgium, my arm wasn't 
a hundred percent um but i made it work and after you know a month it felt great it mm-hmm. was it was back to normal but yeah I, I i think if i finished my career and i just stayed in the nbl i would have lived in regret about what yeah. what could have been um i had a dream of playing euro cup um and even after my first year of leading the scoring in uh Belgium, mm-hmm. uh, the league in scoring. I um, said, "That's it. I'm, I'm playing Euro Cup this year." That was my kind of um, showcase year. And then uh, it took right until the end of uh, kind of free agency period to to sign a deal. Mm. And uh, that was quite stressful. My wife and I were going from Airbnb in Amsterdam every week because I'm like, we're not getting longer than a week because uh, <laughs> it's a bad omen. Yeah, <laughs> she was seven <laughs> months pregnant at the time, wow. and um, but yeah, she she's been fantastic through the whole thing. And then yeah, signed for a Euro Cup team and um, playing in that competition against you know the best players in the world, Alexi Schwed at Kim Key and Bayern Munich and all these teams, uh, and travelling all over Europe um, for a couple of years it was just it really I soaked it all in and um, was able to play at a higher level which um, I think for myself to, to know that I could play at that that really elite level um, you know one day when I retire and I look back I'll be like wow that was mm. that was an incredible journey and um, one thing that I'm very proud about it, it was you know having a dream and um, you know, people saying that, nah, that's, you know, that's above you or I don't think you could play at that level. And then being able to um, back myself and, and sign that contract, play in Euro Cup yeah. for a couple of seasons and, and you know, played really well um, and have a successful team, I think, you know, it all made it worth it. And, yeah, I definitely won't have any regrets when I finish my basketball career now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great credit to you that you actually, like you said, you backed yourself to, to give it a shot when it might have been easier to, to do otherwise um when you come back home now like you said you've got your two kids now um life's obviously very different than it was four four years ago can can you just talk us through what i mean what's it like you know coming home having and getting to be a father i guess now rather than just being i mean i guess it takes a lot of the pressure off just worrying about what's happening on the basketball court yeah it is uh it's surreal because um being a dad is the best thing in the world uh, my two boys are amazing the, uh, you know when you lose a game especially uh, the high pressures of Europe where it's very emotional mm. it's like you know your mum died every time you lose a game <laughs> um, to come home or to see my son you know he runs out onto the court and gives me a big hug and you know you instantly forget about the game but um, you know I think you know life evolves and now um, you know as much as my wife and I would like to go on a few more dates and have a bit more time <laughs> together our our world is our kids and yeah. our family and uh, you know we love it and especially being here in Melbourne in Q East it's a fantastic little area for, for families lots of parks and uh, you know life slowed down and um, I'm really enjoying it all Besides, you know, sometimes the sleepless nights, but uh, yeah, I, I think once you get used to used to the sleep deprivation a little bit, it's it's fantastic. And uh, you know, my son is addicted to the eldest son. He's three this month. Mm-hmm. He's addicted to basketball, mm-hmm. uh, and he plays all day, every day on his little hoop. So wow. he's pretty good, little left hander. <laughs> shoots jump shots and and dribbles now and everything. So. Yeah, maybe he'll be a, a, a little baller in the future. Yeah, no, you never know. Um, one former teammate of yours at Sydney I need to ask about is Luke Cooper. Anytime your name's mentioned, he's yeah. very quick to have to have a jab or two your way. Um, I thought I'd give you this chance. Have you got something you'd like to say back to him on the record? <laughs> well, he's got the old uh, Napoleon syndrome because he's quite short <laughs> yep. and, and quite angry. But <laughs> now, nah, me and Coops go way back, and uh, we always have great banter. Uh, you know, for people on Twitter that might not be familiar, and they think, "Oh, you know, they must have some beef or something." No, it's uh, it's all love. We uh, <laughs> we get along really well, and um, you know, I really enjoy playing with him for a couple of seasons, and. Uh, he's a great guy and he's also just recently had a kid too yeah. so a little boy so maybe they'll uh, grow up giving each other banter like we do all the time too <laughs> now obviously I'm doing this podcast with, with Sean Reddy as you know but he hasn't been able to, to join us because of a, a bit of a hiccup which was not really either of our, either of our faults early in the day um Given he's not what well, was never a lot of fun to play against, and you didn't have a lot of success <laughs> success against him when you're in Sydney, were you in a way relieved that you you managed to avoid having to talk to him? 
<laughs> well, yeah, Sean's one of those guys that uh, I think you hate playing against, mm. but you, he's one of the guys that you'd love to have on your team. Uh, you know, his, uh, his record, win-loss record and success he had there at Perth speaks for itself. And uh, he was just a fantastic player, a nightmare match up mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, at the four, he could take guys off the dribble, he could shoot. Uh, so you didn't know whether to switch the pick and roll or or what you're going to do with him. But, um, no, nah, he had a, he had a good, well, a great career. Um, we cheap shot at each other a few times, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, and I think he, he's, he's got that same kind of white line fever as myself. Yep. Uh, uh, one of those guys off the court who's super chilled, but uh, you know, people come up to me all the time like, man, you're actually, you know, a real nice guy and then chilled <laughs> out off the court because <laughs> people just see you on the court, yeah. the, the fiery nature. So, you know, there's a lot of guys like that and, and characters that are great for the league. Um, and, you know, I've only got a full respect for Sean for what he did mm. throughout his career and everyone that played for him said he was a great teammate too. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a bit disappointed I don't get to speak to him, actually. That's right. We'll, we'll try to arrange you to catch up when you're, <laughs> when you're over in Perth next. Um, Fantastic. Just finally, um, this Sunday, first home game for the club against the Brisbane Bullets. How excited are you to, to get out there for, for that? Yeah, super pumped. Um, you know, they've got some really good players, especially some great guard play, um, which yeah. will be a good challenge. But, you know, we've got John and um, and myself, Kyle, Gibbo will hopefully mm. um, be back from his little calf injury. And I think it's going to be a fantastic matchup. And, um, you know, it's really important for us this first couple of months of the season because I think we have seven or eight out of our first ten at in Melbourne yep. uh, and then we have a bit of a, a horror stretch out in February with a lot of away games so we're really trying to get off to a good start um, and that's one of the reasons why we didn't go to the uh, to an NBA game mm. this year um, because of that fatigue factor so uh, we've got to make the most of it and uh, we know that they're a really good team we played them in the pre-season but they were missing a few players and obviously Andre was away yep. um, but yeah we're excited about playing, especially, you know, give our fans a, another taste because, you know, some of the members wouldn't have been able to go to the last game because it was sold out. So um, we feel like we've got great support here in Melbourne already um, and uh, we're just going to try and keep building and keep playing hard and, and uh, just leave it all, all out on the court. Perfect. Um, thanks very much for joining us. This is just our second episode, so we're still very new into it, but we were very excited to get the chance to have have a chat to you, Ben, and great to see you back in the league, and, yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks a lot, mate. Now, Sean, now that we've heard heard my chat with Ben Madgen, and thanks again to Ben for taking the time out to do that with us, um... It's time for your chat with a former championship teammate of yours from 2014, um, Drake Yu, who it's fair to say he probably ended his playing career prematurely. He spent just a, just a couple of seasons at the Wildcats and he still had a contract, but he, he actually got a better offer. So he, he took up a, a job back at his hometown, Sacramento Kings, as a, as a manager of player development. And then he moved into an assistant general manager role with the Stockton Kings, who is obviously Sacramento's G League affiliate, which is a role he's in now. And he's also performing as a as a professional scout. And recently he was at the, the NBL Blitz having a look at Lamelo Ball and RJ Hampton very closely. So, yeah, it's been a fascinating career for the for the Sacramento native already. He's he's very happy back home in Sacramento, but as as you know, he certainly enjoyed his his time here in Perth. So let's get into into your chat in, into your chat with him as two former championship teammates reconnected. I'm here with Drake UU, former Perth Wildcat championship player back in 2014, now with the Sacramento Kings. How are you, Drake? Thanks for joining us. I'm great, Sean. Thanks for having me, bro. So just get into your story. You were with the Perth Wildcats for a couple of years, won a championship, and then eventually ended up with the Sacramento Kings. Can you tell us how you got to that point? Yeah. Um, so I was back home summer of 2015, um, obviously had opted out of uh, returning to Perth um, and was just kind of home working out, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what my next move was going to be. And uh been speaking with my agent and uh, an opportunity with Cam to come about. Um, so 
uh, was pretty close to, you know, finalizing that. Um, and early in August, I uh, got a call <clears throat> from a mutual friend with Vladi Divac, who at the time had just uh, been named general manager of Sacramento Kings um, and had mentioned the position opening up and asked if I, you know, could come uh, in the next day to interview uh, for a position. So I uh, came in and uh, met with Vladi, um, which still to this day is like surreal to me because, um, you know, he sat down, told me about the position. Um, and like for anyone who's ever met Vladi, like he is, uh, I, here I went into it like pretty nervous and not really sure what to expect, but like Vladi is the most like, uh, genuine, humble, like super approachable human being that like, I mean, what you see on TV and what you, what you hear is, is really, you know, uh, who Vladi is. And so, uh, he made it very conversational and was telling me about it. And, you know, I remember telling him at the time, like, um, I grew up in Sacramento and during, you know, the time where the Kings were kind of going through, uh, some championship runs. And so those great, uh, teams with, <clears throat> you know, Vladi and C Webb and Mike Baby, Doug Christie, Bobby Jackson, Peja, like, these are guys that like I grew up, you know, watching date nightly. And I told him, I'm like, you know, it's crazy because, you know, guys like him are what I feel fueled my passion for the game as a young boy. And so it just kind of came full circle and, and talking with him. And uh, when he mentioned the player development position, it was, it was for like a kind of a dual role where I'm uh, on and off the court uh, working with players. Um, and, you know, the opportunity sounded pretty cool. Um, the NBA front office was something that I had always been interested in um, uh, as far as like what I wanted to do when I was done playing. Um, and so uh, this opportunity sounded really cool. So after I finished meeting with them for about an hour and a half, <clears throat> um, they told me that they'd, the job was going to post in about a month and they'd get back to me. Um, and again, like I was actually planning on signing with Cans and, uh, you know, leaving for Australia in like the next week or two. And so uh, I actually reached back out to, to Vladi and uh, let him know, like, kind of my situation. And I, I wanted to kind of see this opportunity through before making a decision. Um, and so uh, out, of, like, out of nowhere, I ended up getting a, a, the offer letter that night. Um, and so uh, as far as timing for me and my family being in Sacramento and understanding like how diff I, it's, it's really hard to get a foot in the NBA door. Um, and so just kind of prayed about it and, uh, you know, talked it through with my family and just decided that like, this is definitely uh, a new challenge for me and a, an opportunity to start uh, a new career. And so, um, I mean, it, it's not often you can stay in, around basketball and like do what you love on a daily basis. So uh, decided to, I called my agent, Daniel, at the time, Daniel Moldovan, and uh, kind of let him know what it, what was uh, going down and the decision I was going to make, and he fully supported me. And so, um, yeah, that was uh, summer of 2015, and it's crazy. Fast forward, it's been four years now going into year five for me. So um, that was kind of my, my story as far as how I got uh, started with the Kings. So I'm assuming you got the job there, and so you didn't mention Robert Ory's name when you Come went on, for man. your interview. <laughs> <laughs> There's just certain people you, you just don't even bring up in uh, in Sacramento, and that, Robert and, and Kobe and Shaq are at the top. Robbie, Robert's probably at the top, you're right. So I actually yeah, wanted a job, so I wasn't. <laughs> for our listeners, I wasn't uh, bring don't know Robert. Robert Ory is just uh, YouTube his uh, shot versus the Sacramento Kings. Oh, exactly. You know what we're talking about. So, so what's your current role now? I know you've had a few different kind of roles with the Sacramento Kings. What's your current role within the organization? Uh, so currently, I, I help run our G League team. It's uh, based in Stockton. Um, kind of manage the day to day on on that end. Um, you know, uh, the day to day operation, uh, roster composition different transactions, uh, scouting. Um, and then on the King side, I kind of go back and forth, um, 
on the King side, I just do a lot of like our West coast college scouting. Um, so I pretty much go throughout the region and, um, kind of own, own those schools as far as, you know, really understanding, uh, where our, our, our focus list is at and um, target players and um, a lot of like more so the, the personnel side of uh, uh, for the Sacramento side. So um, basically a combination of like running the G League and being with them and then um, supplementing that with a lot of college and, and G League scouting. And I understand you were just currently, uh, recently, I would say, in Australia doing some scouting on the NBL. Can you tell us about that and who are you looking at? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, two weeks prior to uh, the Blitz, uh, our scouting director reached out and mentioned that, you know, a lot of teams are actually going to be sending uh, scouts to Australia to go watch the Blitz. And, you know, me having played in the NBL and having teammates that were still playing and, coaches and just having different contacts over there um he had asked if i'd be interested in going so um i jumped on it and uh you know it, it was an opportunity to get an early look at um two of the young kids that are uh in the next stars program and the nbl um uh, that was a a great trip it was a good chance for me to kind of um you know catch up with some old mates and um, coaches and uh, obviously get an early look at some of these uh, young, talented kids. So um, I think it's great for the league. I think it's, uh, you know, a couple guys have, uh, you know, gone this route in the past and Terrence Ferguson and Brian Bowen. And so I think it's great that, you know, to get like two guys that are projected potential lottery picks uh, playing in the NBA on a nightly basis, I think it's great for, them and I also think it's great for the league and, and you know global basketball altogether. So um, yeah, that was a great chance to uh, you know get back to uh, to Australia and, and the down under and um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I just go back and think about myself as an 18 year old <laughs> coming out and playing the NBA. Right. I think <laughs> there's there's no way they would be even come close to putting up some of the numbers that these guys are doing. So. Uh, it's right, just, yeah. uh, it really is impressive. I'm, I'm excited to see what they do during the regular season as well. And uh, and and do you think this is going to become more of a, a mainstream option for some of these high school kids? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's there's talk over in the U.S. about college players and trying to change um, the compensation route there. And, and even in California, there was some big news there the last couple of weeks. But do you see this as a, a, a pretty viable option for a lot of kids now if, if they have that opportunity? Absolutely. I think that like Australia is a legitimate, uh, A, it's a legitimate league. Um, I think it's uh, an underrated league. And I think about like the transition for uh, some of these kids that like, that like not to go to college. I mean, what better place, A, what better place to spend uh, a winter, an American winter, than, um, you know, being near a beach, being uh, able to like learn how to become a pro uh, a year ahead of a college freshman, um, you know, English speaking, uh, awesome culture. Um, you know, there's a lot of professionalism that goes into the, uh, the NBL clubs are they're very professional. And so everything from like um, off the court appearances to, um, you know, treatment and recovery to the weight room to, on court development and teaching of the game. I think that like they have a legitimate uh, way of developing young players. And, uh, you know, on top of that, to, to be able to actually be paid for, um, you know, their skill, uh, I think is like a very intriguing uh, path. And so I think it's very new. Um, and to me, it's like really exciting. It'll be interesting to see how, uh, you know, the year plays out and, um, you know, how guys like Bowen and, I mean, Terrence is now in his third year, I believe, who's, you know, already starting to show steps. Like, people have done it. I mean, me and you play with James. Like, guys have, Torrey Craig, like, guys have actually had a lot of success coming out of the NBL and, and transitioning and translating to the NBA. And so – you know, I, I think it's only gotten more popular and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 
depending on how LaMelo and RJ finish the year, if it continues to be a legitimate route. I mean, and Didi is also a really impressive player in his own right. Like, and, you know, so the league has really been um, bolstered by, like, the, this young talent. And I think it's only, you know, going to help the, the NBL brand, uh, which I think is great. Yeah, and you've got NBL games playing um, NBA teams as well. You've got Melbourne United coming up to play the Sacramento Kings. Who are you tipping in that one? <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> 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 no, it should be. Uh, I, I think it's awesome as well, just for the uh, the league. The these guys, the teams coming over and playing the NBA. There's just so many great things that the league is doing um, from an exposure point of view, and uh, you're starting to see that 27 scouts. I think there was like a hundred scouts watching RJ Hampton train the other day before they played uh, the Utah Jazz as well. So it's. Um, it's a, exciting. i sorry, Memphis Grizzlies. It's exciting time for for the league and and how um, how it's viewed on a, a global uh, scale as well. And just go back to your time. I guess what you took from your time with the Perth Wildcats and and how um, and I guess what are the fond memories you have of that that time? Um, you know what? When I got to the NBA. Uh, and then looking back at Perth, like Perth, it was so, uh, I have very fond memories of Perth. Like obviously the, the, the friends that I've made, uh, with my teammates there, um, the brotherhood, uh, I think that like, there's a lot of qualities that, uh, are translatable to like successful NBA teams. So when I think of Perth, like I, I almost honestly felt like it was ran like very Spurs like as far as, um, you know, always striving to be best in the class on and off the court. There's a, an accountability that's, um, uh, there's a culture of accountability. I think that they uh, not only recruit talent, but they recruit the person. And these are all things that, like, I think, uh, you know, now Vladi and, and Peja have been able to implement here, and that's how we've been able to kind of turn things around in Sacramento. It's, it's really, like, it's not a big secret as far as how uh, – what makes successful teams. And, um, and so I think like back to Perth, uh, the professionalism, the, uh, you know, us having Perth went out of the, I know Jack went out of his way to provide any resource that we needed as players. Um, and like, I'll just always remember, you know, those, especially that first year, um, winning a championship, uh, starting off the year seven and oh, and, um, you know, just, I'll never forget the fork and knife game. Actually, the fork and knife game is probably one of my favorite memories because that's one of my uh, party tricks now with all my American friends. And I, they, <laughs> they crack up when I tell them, like, I kid you not, it took me an entire year to understand the the uh, <laughs> the pattern behind this. So, shout out to Jesse Wagstaff, you, uh, Sean, you guys literally. Uh, <laughs> You guys got me all year. So, I mean, these are just, like, fun. Like, you know, the team dinners and, like, all the, the off-court bonding that we did. And it was never, like, forced. You know, we always just did it because, like, we enjoyed each other's uh, company. And I think that, like, that's what made us such a great team. And, um, you know, the appearances that we did and getting involved with the community and um, just, like, the amount of uh, the love from the Red Army, like, that fan base is just incredible to me. And I always remember, um, you know, those those per days so the knife and, knife and fork game will, will live in uh infamy and uh you know i think that <laughs> <laughs> you were, you were one of the best ones and uh <laughs> you know for any future uh recruits don't don't give it away it's a it's a rite of passage um, when you when you come to the Perth Wildcats and, and you're on your uh your first uh trip away at, at dinner time just talking about the, the Sacramento Kings. Got it before me. <laughs> that still upsets you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> are you are you trying to uh, – do you get to talk to James Ennis uh, much? You know, obviously he's on the other side of the country, but um, do you get to see him when he comes to town and, and, and is playing the Sacramento Kings these days? Yeah, exactly. No, it's cool. Every time um, 
you know, obviously with, I'm usually, sometimes I'm gone when the teams are coming to Sacramento and playing here. So I think we've actually missed each other maybe the last two times, but, um, you know, every chance we get to catch up and we're in the same town, like we'll grab food and, um, you know, catch up and it's like we pick right back up where we left off. So, um, it's just been fun to watch James. Uh, I know, I mean, we both know the amount of work that he put in that year we were with him and, um, now he's a legitimate NBA vet, and I I couldn't be more happy and, and proud for him. Um, it's been pretty cool watching the success. So yeah, we catch up and, and stay in touch um, through text. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I tell people you know they ask me who the best player I've played with, um, and I, and I give them <laughs> you know for a long time I said James Ennis, and now it's a for me, it's a toss up between James Ennis and Bryce Cotton. So those two guys are just incredible talents. Do you see Bryce Cotton on NBA teams radar at all? Um, yeah, you know, Bryce is like, obviously uh, had a lot of success in the NBA. Uh, the word of mouth that I get in the NBA, like people rave about him here. And I know, you know, he had a, a good uh, amount of time in Utah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he got another chance at all. I think that, uh, He's still proven to be a very productive player, um, and not only productive, but a winner. And so, um, you know, I think that he's still young enough, and uh, sometimes guys go away for a couple of years and they end up, uh, you know, popping back up on an NBA radar, and, and teams are looking for kind of a, a guy that they can rely on that's not a rookie, that's, um, you know, had a lot of uh, overseas experience and is a mature player. And so, um, you know, I, I feel like that, that window can still be open for him, um, or I wouldn't be surprised. So, again, a lot of good talent in the NBL. Um, so, it's been fun to see. And what's the outlook for the Sacramento Kings this year? You guys have got a young ball club. You made some changes. Got Luke Walton coming in as your coach. Uh, what, what's the outlook for your team this year? You know, I think we're um, <clears throat> obviously made some changes. I think we're, we're still uh, a young team that is just trying to be better uh, than last year. I think that, um, you know, this summer we went out and added a lot of uh, veteran leadership and guys that uh, and can come in in our second unit. <clears throat> and um, I think we really added to our depth, which was uh, an issue for us last year at times. And so, you know, adding guys that have, uh, one, like Trevor Reza and Corey Joseph, um, particularly the backup point guard position, um, adding some athleticism and then running and shot blocking with a guy like Deshaun Holmes, um, you know, and then uh, so adding like good vet pieces uh, and then also like, uh, you know, allowing our young guys to continue to grow, guys like De'Aaron and, and Buddy, um you know, re-signing Harrison Barnes uh, and getting him, getting him to stay for the next couple of years. Um, you know, another veteran leader who's, you know, won championships. And then, um, you know, obviously hoping that Marvin um, had a really good summer and hopefully he can take that next step with more opportunity this season. So, um, you know, we added a lot of depth, but not, you know, sacrificing the growth of our young, our young players. Um, so hopefully those guys can continue to mesh well and, um, you know, I, I think that, like, the beauty of, like, Vlad and Paige are, are so in tune with uh, the importance of team ke- building team chemistry and, like, building a, a, a true team that is sustainable over the next couple of years, not just trying to, you know, have, like, a short-minded mindset and trying to win now. I think that, like, we're thinking, you know, not only for the next year or two, but the next five to ten years, like, trying to build that uh, young core and then, like, continue to just, uh, you know, through the draft and through, uh, you know, trade acquisitions, just, like, adding pieces that can ultimately um, win a championship. So I think, um, you know, very fortunate to get a guy like Luke in here, too, who uh, Luke played at a high level. Players, he has that respect from a lot of players, and he has a great way of communicating and with these young, like, with young players today. Um communication is just so important and uh, a relationship with players is so important. So um, he's, you know, he got hired uh, shortly after season and 
um, you know, he's had a, a couple months now to really build relationships uh, with a lot of these young guys. And I think that like, that's really going to pay off for us, uh, hopefully you know, in the next couple of years. So <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm optimistic. Uh, obviously like Sacramento is, is dying for, um, you know, a spot in the playoffs. The West just is like such a, <laughs> it just keeps getting harder every year. But, you know, for us, I think we're thinking long-term and, and trying to, really um, just trying to keep getting better every day and building confidence as a, as a unit and kind of going from there. So, Well, it might be easier to beat your uh, your close rivals in the Golden State Warriors. They've lost a few pieces uh, this year. So we wish you all the, the best this year. I, you know, I'm uh, going to be looking at the Sacramento Kings and, and hoping that you guys have a fantastic year. And uh, thanks, thanks for your time today. It's it's been awesome for me to catch up with uh, one of my favorite teammates. And you know, credit credit to you to where you're at today, and and taking you know, going from being a college graduate, come out here to Australia, experience something new, and now you're sitting in the NBA and 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 watching NBA games on a nightly basis within that organization is, is awesome for you. Proud of you, and uh, thanks for taking the time with us today, Drake. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate you, Sean. Sean, you, uh, real quick before I leave, I will always remember, I can ask about what I remember. I think, like, the NBL is great because of players like you as far as, like, um, I always remember you being, like, that one vet who I would always look up to and, like, your professionalism, the way that you handled yourself. Um, you having played in, about, at that point when I went over there, you'd already played in the league, like, 15 or 20 years. So I was like, what do I need to do to play as long as Sean Red is the scoring machine? And I think that, like, that to me is one of the most underrated parts of the league because guys like LaMelo and guys like RJ and, you know, these young players that come over, for them to have examples like you, I think is, like, a really strong – I mean, it's the same way in the NBA. Like, they're going to have vets in the NBA locker room. And I think that, like, when I think of you, Sean, I think of, you know, that, like, Tim Duncan, like, figure in an NBA locker room. It's like, okay, like, this is how you do it, young fellow. Like, come get shots in with me every day, like. Those are things that I'll always remember from my playing career. And granted, I didn't get a chance to play in the NBA, but, like, you are that veteran figure in the locker room and, like, leader, and you can back it up with your play. But, like, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been fun catching up. Um, not to toot your horn too much, but, like, also one of my favorite teammates, man. So, no, I'll tell you, thanks to that, Drake. I'll, anytime you throw Tim Duncan out there, you, you got my ears uh, listening. So I appreciate <laughs> same, that. Same it's athleticism. Been... <laughs> <laughs> yes, not a lot of dunks. It's <laughs> fundamental, right? Hey, so yeah. it's, been, it's been great to catch up with you, and uh, we'll be looking for the Sacramento Kings, and hopefully next time you come out to Australia, you make it a little bit farther west and we can catch up in person. Sounds good, man. Tell your family hi. Now, Sean, round two, we're, we're into the second week of the season Season already. Gets underway with a doubleheader Friday night. Um, Brisbane Bullets, their first game on their home floor for, this, for the season. Um, and they're up against the, the Cairns Taipans, obviously. As you touched on touched on before, that was a, a good way for the Taipans to start their season last year with a win in Brisbane before, before things fell off the rails a little bit with a 14... 14- Game losing streak, um, but Brisbane looked good last week. Um, what are your thoughts on on this game to open the round? Well, Brisbane, you know they want to get off to a good start. Obviously, Cairns is going to be desperate for a win. Cairns had their number last year, beating them three out of four times. So I'll be interested to see if, if Brisbane can make adjustments with that, and if Cairns can find a closer as well. So Brisbane going into a new stadium is. So we'll see how they uh, respond to their new home. I think sounds like it'll be a little bit more potent than the library of the Brisbane <laughs> Entertainment Center. So let's hope that they get a strong home court presence in game one. Yeah, that's hope so because they're, they're, they're a good team and they look like they're well and truly a, a finals contender. Um, second game Friday night, RSA Arena, Perth Wildcats, Illawarra Hawks. Um, Gee, there's been some some horror horror showings there for the the Hawks over over the years, but they've got a new coach now, Matty Flynn, um, a very young team. So there's not too many guys with scars there. How do you think they'll they'll go coming in, into the jungle? 
Well, they've lost 31 of their last 32 overall <laughs> in the West. So it's uh, not looking great for Illawarra. And uh, you see, they've got some new players as well. You know, can Aaron Brooks bring that? I think I kind of feel like you really need someone to step up, have 30 or 40 points to get a win over the Wildcats here in the West. So it's uh, Aaron Brooks could be that type of guy that really can go off. And um, although he's going to have a guy named Damian Martin guarding him. So it's, you know, Perth's going to want to try and get a lot of wins early on because they got four out of the first five at home. So it's, uh, they're, they're, and they're going to be motivated to play better than they did against Melbourne United. So I expect Perth Wildcats to get one. That one, I expect Brisbane to be canned. I expect Damien to spend most of the time guarding Aaron Brooks, but how do you think someone like Ilamelo Ball will cope having Damien Martin in his face? He wouldn't have experienced anything like that in his life just yet. It will be interesting to see how he goes. He played well in the preseason against Damien Martin. I think it actually kind of plays into Lamelo Ball's hands at the moment because I think when you pressure him, he is so quick that he can get around. Damian Martin likes to to pressure and try and force you into bad decisions and that type of thing. I think if I'm guarding LaMelo Ball, I'm going to stand off in the keyway and make him shoot. Mm -hmm. Uh, He hasn't hit a three yet. He's got to prove that he can hit that because he's dynamic attacking the basket. So I'll be interested to see how they scout and play him Mm -hmm. in that regard as well. With Wildcats, your tip? Wildcats is my tip. Um, Saturday, Sydney Kings, Adelaide 36ers. Kings obviously... Started with a good good win last week uh, up in Cairns. Adelaide coming off a bit of a, a shellacking from the the Utah Jazz over over in the United States. So this is their their first crack to start the season. And and gee, for for Jerome Randall to to come back to the Adelaide 36ers and for his first game to be be against the Sydney Kings and and Kevin Lynch and Casper where they're waiting for him. Um, it's a pretty salivating prospect. Yeah, that that to me that's the most intriguing game of the round with Sydney and Adelaide. How is Adelaide going to respond a 50-point loss to the Utah Jazz? Obviously, the Wildcats lost by 50 last year in the preseason, responded pretty well uh, against the Denver Nuggets, and then heading into the NBL season, winning uh, 10 quick games uh, early on out of their first 11. So it's going to be interesting to see how Jerome Randall handles going back to Sydney. I didn't think Sydney looked great in their first game, so they're trying to fit in all their pieces. And we know Adelaide's had a lot of – success against Sydney in recent times as well. So Adelaide's kind of been the Sydney's bogey team. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how this one plays out. But I do expect Sydney to get over the line. But I think it'll be closer than people think. Next up on Sunday, two two informed teams. We've got the South East Melbourne Phoenix coming off, off their good start against Melbourne last week and, and playing a, a Brisbane team who would have already played on, on Friday night as well. So... An interesting one on the road for, for the Bullets, having having played two nights earlier. But, yeah, the, it's, it's a, probably a tough game to call because both teams look pretty good in the opening round. They did, but I think Ty Wesley missing for Southeast Melbourne. I'm not sure Mitch, Keek, Mitch Creek is going to bring 28 points and four or five from the three-point line on a weekly basis. But credit to him, he played fantastic in that game one. But I do think Brisbane playing their second game, traveling, is going to be tough. And I think Southeast Melbourne is going to be playing with a lot of emotion, being their first home game ever for a new franchise. So I'm picking Southeast Melbourne Phoenix to get that one. Round concludes then on Monday night. Illawarra Hawks and the Cairns Taipans, two teams who, depending on how they go early in the round, might be pretty desperate for a for a win, two teams that are, are trying to climb the ladder this season. It's, a, it's an interesting game because you wouldn't want to be on the losing end of, end of this one, I don't think. Well, you could look at both those teams being 0-2 going into that game. So you do not want to be 0-3. There'll be a lot of desperation in that one. I feel like Illawarra will get that one because they've, uh, you know, they, they, they played okay in the game one and they're coming off a tough travel schedule to Perth. But being at home... I think they'll, they'll get that one over Cairns, especially with Cairns having to back up and play their second game on the weekend as well. So I pick an Illawarra in that one, but that one uh, that one could go either way, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, if you noticed last week, you can check out social media for our tips and we'll keep track of those throughout the season and potentially make something of that in terms of getting a bit of a sponsorship on board. They can they can follow our tips throughout the season and of course anyone anyone that listening can send through their tips as well and we can keep track of those and What was our record last week, Pikey? I reckon we did pretty well. I, we certainly got we got the Phoenix first up. We both went for the Phoenix. 
we both got the Kings on Friday. We both got the the Wildcats and. I think we both got the bullets. I think we're we're four and zero. Four and zero. So uh, I'm not saying if you want to uh, follow us, we could uh, <laughs> we could we could help you with your your picks in the NBL on a weekly basis. Four and zero, pretty good start. Absolutely. Let's hope we're what nine and zero by 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 ne- next week when we're back again. So, Sean, just before we we finish, what are you most excited about seeing this weekend? Look, I think there's a lot of intriguing matchups, but for me, Jerome Randall, how is he going to handle going back to Sydney? I just feel like he's a perfect fit for Adelaide, and I think he's going to be excited to, to get back there in Sydney and, and how he handles that. And, uh, you know, he's going to be the barometer for how well this Adelaide 36ers, are they going to be able to compete for that top four spot? So I'm excited to see his uh, go up against his former teammates yeah. and go up against Casper Ware as well. <laughs> yeah, it'll be, be fantastic. And yeah, uh, plenty more to look forward to as well. And let's hope that you've enjoyed our second episode here of, of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. We've certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Thanks to Hoops Heaven for, for helping us bring it to you. Thanks to our guests for, for making it what was hopefully a, an enjoyable show. And let's hope we can do it all again next week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Have a great time.